All right, welcome back to Central Valley Buzz, everybody. I'm your host, Chuck Leonard, and it's time for Old Town Mariposa 2.0. Let's bring in Bob Borchard. Bob, welcome back, and can you tell me who your guest is this segment? Nice time. Are you still on my tie? You know what? By the way, how'd you like, how'd you like that? I commercial? got a bolo tie for you that I'm going to bring one of these days. Okay, I'm good for that. Dr. Leroy Anthony Westerling, Ph.D. professor at University of California down at Merced, right down the road. From How's Denver. this? Welcome, Leroy. Thank how, you, sir. How, how are you? Here. Now, uh, Bob, why did why, you bring Leroy over here today? Uh, Leroy is, is one, of, one of those people who caught my imagination. Uh, he is a climate scientist. I, as a city planner, have been trying to deal with the issue of climate change and adaptability as a planner. How do it, how our cities adapt to the new realities? As a, as a professor at the University of California down at Merced, Leroy, uh, Dr. Westerling, uh, studies fire. Fire is something that's really near and near to us. Not in, so dear, in the, in but near, mountain. right? Near to us. Now, you, you see, you, you study fire. Do you study the impact that the fire has on, a, on the community and, <laughs> and the environment? So what we study is what drives the fires, what causes them, uh, what governs the timing and the size, the severity, how that might change over time, how it has changed in the recent past, and some of the impacts it can have. Yeah. T tell me, Leroy, how, when you're going into college, were you saying, well, you know what I want to do is I want to be a professor and I want to <laughs> teach people about the severity of fire? No. You probably no, not, no, right? No, no, so no. How, how does this I was come a to tangled trail. I, you know? I understand. How does this all come together? <laughs> so actually, you really wanted this story because it said, Let's you know, do it. You know, all right, we're here. So, all right, all right. <laughs> I, uh, I was in high school in Scotts Valley, California. I, I grew up right by there. Yeah, and um, little school, 130 students, maybe 20-something in the senior class, and I had no idea what I wanted to do uh, in college. So I was torn between English literature at UC Santa Cruz right. and aerospace. You know where that one got. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, nowhere. <laughs> Poverty. <laughs> uh, but, you know, enjoy. I probably would have enjoyed it. Uh, uh, and aerospace engineering at UCLA. I wanted to build, you know, Mars rockets. landers yeah. and rockets and stuff. So I went, I, w I ended up going to UCLA because when I said I was going to Santa Cruz, the recruiter at UCLA called me up and said, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm not crazy. Yeah, no, UC Santa Cruz, you will be. Yeah, but right. you know what? I hated it. I absolutely hated uh, all, you know, the classes I had to take. So I bailed. Uh, and I got a degree in uh, international economics and Chinese studies. And when I graduated, I went and taught English in China. Wow. And when I came back, I worked in a nuclear power plant, and then I had a consulting job. And uh, what, what, what did you do at a nuclear power plant? <laughs> I was a baker. I was of on course. the midnight <laughs> shift. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we had several thousand construction workers in there every day, refurbishing the, the core of one of the reactors. And um, so I, I led the baking in the kitchen every night in the graveyard shift. I find it a little bit <laughs> odd that you're the baker, but you know that we're rebuilding the core of the yeah. nuclear plant. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I cooked everything they ate during the day, you know, thousands of rolls and mm -hmm. cupcakes and what have you. So, and this is where, where, where was this nuclear plant at? Diablo Canyon. Okay. Yeah. And so how did you make your way to Well, set? I... I, I uh, I went to graduate school. In Merced? In San Diego. Okay. And uh, I got He a, had to learn to surf. Where I, where I did, I was required to learn to surf for a while, yeah. <laughs> and uh, while I was there, I also got a couple of PhDs in uh, uh, economics and international affairs, which is basically statistics and policy studies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but my, my research was on climate. Uh, it was a combination of climatology and insurance derivatives, you know, so like complex contracts for spreading the risk uh, the insurance companies face when, mm -hmm. they, when they have a lot of correlated risks, when they have a lot of risks that all could go bad at the same time. 
And uh, when I finished that, I went and worked to the climate research group in, uh, in uh, San Diego. And, and, then, uh, I, and then I became a professor at UC Merced after a while. So are there a bunch of young folks that want to learn about fire? Is yeah. there a big need for this? So there are a lot of people who are studying fire now because it's such a big deal in the Western U.S. You know, it's really changed a lot over Will it become a bigger decades. deal? And it's going to become, continue to become a bigger deal. It's, it's been changing for a while. Yeah. Wow. So the, the kids that are taaking this from you mm. in, in school. They're not kids. They're actually young adults. Large. Okay. You know, big guys. Big when girls. they take these classes from you, what direction are they going in their education to their career? So some of them are undergraduates and they're getting, you know, more generic degrees and, and maybe they'll work in uh, environmental sciences and maybe they won't. And some of them are graduate students uh, in things like ecology, hydrology, you know, uh, studying earth sciences. And uh, they, they learn things from me like uh, statistical programming for data visualization, data analysis, things like that. Okay. Now I know that you brought a lot, some pictures with you. Yeah, and I maybe did. these pictures can uh, tell the story a little bit more. Yeah, so this first one is just showing the number of large forest fires around the western U.S. You know, there's a lot of fires every day during the fire season that ignite and get put out really quickly or even go out by themselves. And it's just a small fraction of the fires that cause most of the damages. So what we really care about are those big fires. What drives them? Because that's what drives all the cost and, and all the changes in our ecosystem. So that graph is showing... Uh, the number of large forest fires on federal lands around the western U.S., because most of our forests are federal, as I'm sure everybody around here knows. And those, those horizontal black bars, those are showing the long-term averages, so the averages by decade. So as you can see is that every decade, there's more fire than the decade before. It's just been growing continuously for 40 uh, years. So for four, that's a 40-year graph. Yeah. So what contributes to the increase in fires Con continuous like that. So these are forest fires. And when you think about a forest, forests have a lot of fuels in them. They've got, they got trees in them, and they've got dead branches and stuff. You know, so you got a lot of fuel. So really what limits whether it can burn or not is how flammable it is. And what makes a forest flammable, is, right? Is it, 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 it's how much precipitation, how much rain and snow you got in the winter, because right. that's when we get most of ours here. And then how warm it is in the spring and summer. Because if you get a warm spring, you're going to have uh, earlier snow melt. And that means in your dry summer, Less you're going to have a longer fire season, right? Because that, you know, that, that snow brings the water a little bit later into the season than what we get from straight rainfall and snowfall. Now, now, now what about climate-wise? What do you mean by well, climate? Well, you said you can climatology, and what, what, how does this all work in? So when I say climatology, what we're doing is we're looking at how averages and distributions of climate change over time. So like this next figure here. Okay. Each of those dots represents how many forest fires there were in a fire season. So if you go up and down on the vertical axis there, the higher you get, the more forest fires are. And as you go from left to right, the warmer it is in that season. So what you see in there is that as the temperatures increase, you get more fires. And it's not a linear Large thing. Fire. You get over a certain threshold and you get a lot more fires and a lot more variability. And that variability is there because there's all these other things that matter for fire too. Like uh, if you have uh, uh, suppression resources available, you know, firefighters are nearby, you know, what kind of terrain it ignited in, how many lightning strikes there were. So almost all the increase in, in fire has occurred in, in lightning ignited fires. Wow. and, and uh, not, not human caused fires. And uh, it's really been concentrated in places like uh, the Northern Rockies, you know, uh, Yellowstone, and then to a lesser extent, quite a few in, in the California, the Sierras. To a lesser extent, that's, that's a key word because, you know, we live in the middle of where that lesser extent seems to happen a lot. That's right. And uh, that's, that's why we have a very sophisticated firefighter program in our high school. And that's why we have uh, people at UC uh, Merced studying fire and fire science uh, in Merced near Yosemite National Park. Okay. Now, I, what's this picture right here? That, that last one, the canyon shot. That's not mine. That's, that's his picture. Oh, that's He's your shot. In there. Oh, wow. I, I, I took some pictures of, of fire. Uh, Leroy 
wanted to, to talk about, you know, the dispersion of fire. Uh, living in fire country, uh, you know, my house has always been uh, kind of a full, I get to watch a lot of fire. So I thought to make this thing real, I would show you what, what it looks like. <laughs> It is beautiful. It's terrifying, though. Yeah. When you're when you're near a, fo a forest fire, uh, when you're in an area where the smoke is is so thick you can just barely see your hand in front of your face, the animals that live in the in the mountains they all of a sudden take on. We become part of their protection, and and wild animals actually get really close to human beings in in a, in a fire area. They're looking for us to try to protect them. Trying to show, show them the it's, way out. It's a it's 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 living up there is a whole different story than watching it on Channel Twenty Four News, uh, you know, down in Fresno. And I, I put those pictures on to try to uh, to connect the dots for people why Leroy is such a, an important person in our life, and I think in the uh, in the whole scheme of things, because you know the the more we understand how this uh, climate change is affecting our forests. And, and the, uh, the transitions that the forests are going into with respect to a drier climate, um, I think that the better off we all are. And this has implications not only just for Mariposa where the fire is in our backyard, it has implications from the state with respect to budget, budget policy. It has, uh, it has implications with respect to our educational system. You know, we are teaching our young people how to deal with fire in a, in a uh, really progressive way. So that's why well, Leroy is here today. <laughs> Leroy, thank you very much for coming by. It was so cool to well, see you. It was a pleasure talk. to meet you. Thank I, you I, very I, much. Sir. I thank you. Come back again sometime. Let's not forget that this weekend's a big weekend in Mariposa. The Sierra Art Trail is going to be going on and Friday Night Live. Yes. Rob, right. I want to thank you for coming by. I'll see you next week when me and you take you guys to Old Town Mariposa. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. <laughs>